Hey everyone, I'm Joshua Oro, the Mustang Prince, and welcome to Mustang Prince Oral Reports. What can you say about Greek mythology? When it comes to stories like Hercules, Theseus and the Minotaur, Jason and the Golden Fleece, and the Odyssey, these ancient myths have been the most notable stories since the beginning, and they've been retold many times, whether it be in movies, TV shows, or comic books. Now, I know it's been almost four years since I looked at Disney's Hercules on my show. However, today, I would like to share my thoughts on an animated movie about the great myths that I managed to find on YouTube during fall 2014. And I want to thank Zach Kenny, along with Huey Tumor, and the infamous Diamanda Hagen for leading me to it back then. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, let's get started, shall we? Released in the United States on May 3rd and in Japan on October 27th, 1979, the movie is Metamorphosis, a.k.a. Orpheus of the Stars, a.k.a. Winds of Change. Now, on for the plot of the movie. This film presents five stories from the Roman poet Ovid's narrative of Greek legends, which consists of Actaeon, Orpheus and Eurydice, the House of Envy, Perseus, and Phaeton. And what are my thoughts on this movie anyway? Well, after watching the movie on YouTube and seeing Huey and Diamanda's review, I gotta say, this movie is really interesting but also weird, dark, disturbing, and I think it's also very underrated these days. But do I enjoy it? Well, yeah, I do. But it's one movie that I don't recommend for younger kids, though. But to further explain why, let's move on to Mustang Notes. Now, this movie is a Japanese anime anthology film produced by Sanrio, whom I've talked about in my blog of the two Unico movies. The movie was an American golden age of Disney-influenced anime, and it was Sanrio's second animated release in the U.S. following their adaptation of The Mouse and His Child the previous year. The film had over 170 animators, all employed in Hollywood, and it took three years to put this movie together. The film tried to be the rock era's answer to Fantasia, but unfortunately, its original run was critically revealed and closed as soon as it opened. According to many of its crew, many problems with the production, music, and the plot were to blame. On May 3rd, 1979, the movie was renamed to Winds of Change, with seven minutes trimmed from the first cut of 89 minutes long. This time, the music was composed by Alec Arcostandinos, with disco songs sung by Arthur Sims and Patty Brooks, and narration provided by two-time Academy Award winner Peter Ustinov. Now let's talk about the animation, and in my opinion, the Japanese animation in this movie is almost similar to Western animation or Disney style, but while some parts can be creepy, dark, and a little raunchy at times, it's still decent nonetheless. Also, to me, the movie's beginning is really interesting with the opening credits looking like it came from Star Wars or other movies like that, plus the creation of the universe, which is done by Chaos, the first thing to have ever existed, is really breathtaking. And I think one part about this sequence may have been the inspiration for The Last Unicorn. Now here's where we come to the music. As mentioned earlier, the music was composed by Alec Arcostandinos, and to me, I think his musical score is very majestic. Although, there are times 
when the music can become very peaceful or it can be really creepy and strange. As for the songs performed by Arthur Sims and Patty Brooks, in my opinion, they're all good and I think they're underrated disco styled songs, despite the fact that they don't really mesh well with the Greek myth scenarios. Some of my favorite songs in this movie are Red Hot River of Fire and Where Are You Going Perseus? I also like the other songs like Star Child, Future Legend, and You Gave Me Dreams. Also to note, not only does Peter Ustinov provide the narration, but he also voices all the characters, which makes me think back to other actors who did the exact same things before him. For example, there was Sterling Holloway, who did all the voices for Peter and the Wolf in Disney's Make Mine Music, Bing Crosby in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow in The Avengers of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, as well as Dinah Shore in Bongo from Fun and Fancy Free. Now, I know it's been a long time since I talked about Peter Ustinov in my blog of Disney's Robin Hood, and I know he's a great actor and all. However, in my opinion, I think Peter Ustinov's narration is really epic. Though, his acting for the other characters can sometimes be either wise, powerful, scary, and silly at times. Now here's where we come to our star for the film, a boy whom the narrator names Wondermaker. To me, this little boy looks almost like a Rankin Bass version of Disney's Pinocchio. But maybe that's just me. Anyway, Wondermaker plays five different characters throughout the movie. His characters are Acteon, Orpheus, Mercury, aka Hermes, whose face kind of makes me think of Peter Pan in a way. And Wondermaker also plays Perseus and Phaeton. Now let's move on to the stories in the movie, starting with Acteon, the greatest hunter in all of Greece. In this story, while hunting in the woods of Primeval, Acteon comes across a magical spring with an enormous fountain, playful fairies, a griffin, and a beautiful woman taking a shower under a waterfall, who turns out to be the goddess of the hunt herself, Diana, a.k.a. Artemis. Unfortunately, after Diana and the fairies see Acteon watching, she turns plants into flamingos, leaves into birds, trees into dragons, and summons a flippin' unicorn in her rage. And, as punishment for invading her privacy, Diana transforms Acteon into a stag. And not long afterwards, it becomes worse when Acteon gets chased and torn to shreds by his own hunting dogs. To me, this story is very serious, especially after seeing this wall painting in Pompeii last summer. Also, aside from Acteon getting killed by his dogs, to me, the most violent scene is when Acteon stabs a wild boar that charges at him. Plus, there are some silly moments when Acteon tries to hunt a rabbit, as well as getting flacked by sticks and falling into holes. Also, the part involving Diana and her fairies is the most serious part in the story, due to it giving the lesson not to spy on women when they're bathing, especially if they're gods. Make me glad I'm not a dirty young man. The second Greek myth in the movie is the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Now, for those of you who don't know who Orpheus is, 
or who haven't seen my blog of Hell and Back, Orpheus is the legendary musician, poet, and prophet from Greek mythology known for playing his famous instrument, the lyre, which is a small harp thing. However, in this version, Orpheus has a habit of dropping or losing said lyre. Anyway, after his wife Eurydice gets bitten by a snake made of smoke, which is said to come from the underworld, Orpheus goes on a journey to said underworld in hopes to get Eurydice back. To me, this story is pretty weird, but still heartbreaking, due to a few things, like Eurydice's death being different from the way it was in the myth, Cerberus being portrayed as an Orthros, and the underworld, for some reason, has a room filled with candy. However, I think the portrayal of Pluto, aka Hades, makes him look like a mighty minotaur. And I like that after Orpheus makes Hades cry while playing his lyre, he agrees to let Eurydice go back to the living on the condition that Orpheus must not look back until they have reached the top of the stairs. But still, the ending is very heartbreaking. Also, I think the idea of Eurydice turning into leaves when she dies makes me wonder if this was the inspiration for Gale in Frozen 2. Next is the story of the House of Envy, a.k.a. the story of a glorious and hearsay, where Little Wonder Maker takes on the role of Hermes, the god of speed. In this story, Hermes watches a festival where a group of handmaidens bring gifts to the statue of Athena, goddess of war. During the festival, Hermes becomes smitten with a handmaiden named Herse after seeing her help her sister, Ponderosus, after she was rudely pushed down by her other sister, Aglorus, for nothing moves a god's heart more than an act of kindness. At the same time, Aglorus becomes greedy and steals a golden goblet that Herse was offering to Athena. Later that night, Athena meets with the goddess of envy to punish Aglorus. She orders envy from the entrance of her laboratory to make a jealousy venom, which is said to have no cure, and give it to Aglorus while she's sleeping. The following day, when Hermes is meeting with Herse, Aglorus tries to seduce the god of speed into loving her instead, and she offers Hermes the golden cup that she stole from Athena. Unfortunately, as punishment, Hermes petrifies the jealous handmaiden with his magic. In my opinion, this story is really thought-provoking, especially with the scene where Athena's statue comes to life and the scene involving the Goddess of Envy. Plus, the scene where Envy kisses Aglorus was really dark and sickening. However, the scene where Hermes pays Aglorus five gold coins to see Herse was really kind of weird. I mean, since when does a god need to pay to see a girl? Zeus and Poseidon never had to pay to see women. And now we come to the story of Perseus and Medusa. In this story, Perseus is being sent by King Polydeces to fetch Medusa's head, hoping that he'll be turned to stone and not interfere with his wedding to Perseus's mother. Along the way, Perseus comes across a weak old man with a crutch and an old lady trapped on a pillar in the midst of a flash flood, both of which happen to be the gods Hermes and Athena, who have been sent by Zeus to test Perseus and assist him on his quest. Hermes assists Perseus by giving him the ability to fly, and Athena offers Perseus her own shield and tells him to find the three witches 
who share one eye in hopes of knowing where to find Medusa's lair. To me, this has got to be, be my favorite story in the entire movie, and I find it interesting that Wonder Maker plays both Perseus and Hermes in the same scene. Also, Perseus's ability to fly makes me want to have that too. As for the three sisters, well, I wonder why they're bigger than the way they are in the myth. Plus, to me, this movie's version of Medusa is kind of surprising. I mean, when Perseus first sees her, she looks like the nameless blonde girl who previously played Herse and Eurydice, but when Medusa shows her true form, she looks very frightening with a disgusting looking front. And I bet you guys are probably asking, how does this version of Perseus defeat Medusa? Well, he doesn't chop off her head like in the myth or in Clash of the Titans. Nope. Instead, Perseus covers himself in fear with Athena's shield, only for Medusa to get petrified by her own reflection. Despite the fact that Medusa's reflection never turns anybody into stone in the myth, especially not Medusa herself. But not long after Medusa's defeat, her severed stone head turns into Pegasus. And in my eyes, this design looks very interesting. I mean, it's a winged horse with a snake head. I mean, how amazing is that? And finally, we come to our last Greek myth, the story of Phaeton. This story tells about a young cart driver who is the son of of the sun god Apollo, who in this movie for some reason is referred to as Helios, which is a titan's name. Anyway, Phaeton is tired of driving a cart pulled by two stubborn donkeys and would rather drive a chariot like his father does every day. So the following morning, Phaeton sneaks into his father's temple in an attempt to joyride Apollo's chariot and horses. Seeing that nobody's around, it gives Phaeton the opportunity to ride off into the sky. But later, things get worse when the horses realize that Phaeton is at the reins. And so, the horses go so fast that they build up more flames which causes Phaeton to catch fire and fall off the chariot to his death. Man, a little boy burning to death and exploding? What a way to end this movie. Anyway, let's move on to my final words. Overall, Winds of Change is an interesting movie, but I can't say that it doesn't have its flaws. While I do give it credit for not giving most of the Greek myths happy endings or anything like that, they still took certain liberties with a few of them, and to me, some worked out okay while others were silly, embarrassing, or overall unnecessary. On the other hand, the animation was good to say the least, while there were times where it can be dark, raunchy, or disturbing. Also, due to the characters of Wonder Maker and the nameless blonde girl, this movie kind of feels like a school play, though. Plus, the musical score by Alec Arco Standinos is really good, and the disco songs, while not fitting to the Greek myths, are still decent songs to listen to on their own. Lastly, Peter Ustinov was a great narrator for the movie, though... I would have preferred to hear other actors, too. However, while I don't think this is a movie that younger kids should watch, I might recommend it for folks who like Greek myths, though. As for my rating, I give it a 50% out of 100. 
Yeah, it's not exactly a good movie, but I'd be willing to watch it more than once. Though, I just hope that someday it can get released to DVD. But until then, I can still watch it on YouTube, though. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to join me again next time where I look into a Disney-related mouse movie from the 70s. Mustang Power.